رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحد دوكتا من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله everyone I want to first say a big thank you to you to all of you guys for joining us this evening uh, for our first session of vitals um, this series has been the result of many months of planning following you know curriculum design and substantial input from medical students across the country and indeed we've had a lot of input from even alumni from many years gone by so we're very very excited to have you here tonight uh, my name is Ennis I'm a third year medical student um, studying at Imperial and I myself have been one of the members of the vitals team this year so firstly I think it's important just for me to explain a little bit more about what vitals is maybe you guys have had a chance to watch the trailer video and even had a look at what the, the session descriptions for, for each of the workshops um, but for this little brief intro, I just want to go through the, the goals and sort of the vision behind this program. And then inshallah, I will hand over to our esteemed uh, speaker, Dr. Wajid, who will be leading our first, seg first session. So to, now being, being a healthcare student, as I'm, as I'm sure you guys can agree with me in saying, um, it's, it's not an easy task. Um, and, you know, we're tasked with studying all of the intricacies of the human body, the mechanisms of disease, you know, how to treat it all, not to mention how much anatomy we have to know and, and all the drugs that we need to memorize. You know, and on top of that, you know, the prospect of having a career in healthcare, which as we know is tough, involving many hours worth of sacrifices, you know, it's going to be a big commitment. But on, on the flip side, there is a rewarding side to it. But when it comes to the way in which we should be living our lives, it is often easy to become swept up in this sort of conveyor belt, if you like, consisting of, you know, university, you know, the friends that we have and the commitments to them, you know, the exams that we sit during university, and then after university, we have our work and our career, potentially marriage, and then, you know, and potentially even a career advancement. So, you know, if you were to talk to your classmates who perhaps aren't Muslim, you know, they would probably have similar aspirations to you. And they would also be in this sort of conveyor belt, if you like. And their motivations are likely similar. You know, and, and like you, you know, they want to help people. and They want to have a positive impact on people's lives. But then, you know, with that in mind, it kind of begs the question, you know, what sets us apart as Muslims and as Muslim healthcare students? You know, and you guys can agree, me, agree with me when I say that, you know, we have been blessed with this, with this faith, which is a truly beautiful way to live, to live your life. You know, it's not just about, you know, following rituals, you know, praying, reading the Quran and that sort of thing. We should also be aware that, you know, being a Muslim medical student means that our faith should govern almost every aspect of our life, of our lives. So as a, as a vitals team, you know, we were reflecting on this sort of issue and there are many important questions that arose. So for example, you know, we asked ourselves, you know, is it the case that as Muslims within a healthcare setting, the, is it the case that the only time that we really consider our faith is just to, for example, check whether we can work in a particular medical specialty? Or for example, you know, we, we might shoehorn in a, a rushed salah between a 10 hour intense focused library session, for example. You know, we really don't give you know, our faith and the worship the time and the effort that it deserves effectively fitting in our, our, our prayers around our, our studies and not, the opposite, and not the other way around, right? We, you know, we call ourselves Muslim medics, but, you know, maybe are we just medics who happen to be Muslim, you know? And, and, and effectively, we might even get caught up on this in this conveyor belt that I mentioned earlier. And if you like, you know, to use the phrase, we might lose the wood, you know, lose the lose side of the wood for the trees. Um, and so, you know, with these issues sort of in mind and with these kind of, kind of problems bouncing around within discussions, we decided to come up with a workshop series um, called Vitals. And, and here's where the purpose of Vitals really comes in. And as we've said many, many times before, um, in our you know, various publicity um, avenues, we, we're trying to instill the aspects of the Beamer Vision, which I'm, as I'm sure you probably heard of, it's, it's unite, inspire, and serve. So for example, in the first session, which is the one for today, we're covering the sort of the aspect of understanding and inspiring. So, trying to understand and really analyze the true identity of a Muslim healthcare student and try and build upon that and, you know, and help you sort of reach that sort of true identity. And then we're gonna try and use this understanding to, to sort of navigate our way and try and really understand what our potential is as a Muslim, uh, Muslim healthcare student. You know, we're gonna take inspiration from ourselves and take inspiration from others, you know? And we're gonna also cover things like, you know, what can stop you from reaching your potential and, and the various common pitfalls faced by students and especially Muslim healthcare students that are in your place. And then in the next session, we'll be covering the other aspects like unite and serve, um, but that's for another time, inshallah. And so just as a recap, the aim of vitals is sort of twofold. You know, that as students within a healthcare sort of science discipline, 
We are blessed to have this incredible skill set of not just intelligence, you know, but the ability to communicate, the ability to empathize with patients and other individuals. And, you know, I'm sure you can agree it would be such a shame if we aren't able to use these gifts, not only to, to reach our potential as individuals, but of course as an ummah as well. Uh, Dr. Wajah will cover in further detail these aspects, you know, but for example, there are things like imposter syndrome, you know, the inferiority complex associated with that, which can sometimes leave us feeling, you know, kind of feeling the need to just keep our heads down and sometimes, sometimes the feeling that we're sort of second best in every situation. However, the truth of it is, is that we should be enjoying and sort of excelling in our, in our fields, you know, not, not feeling this sort of, you know, the fact that we're second best or not, in, not, not truthfully in the place that we are. You know, and, and Muslims, as, as, as you guys may have heard of, you know, you know, from a history lesson, for example, have been pivotal in the development of modern medicine. You know, with Muslims like Ibn Sina, whose works were seen as the final authority on medicine for many centuries. People like Ibn al-Haytham, who was one of the first to develop the scientific method, which, as I'm sure you guys um, are familiar with in the modern day. You know, the, the unfortunate reality is that we don't really hear about these names within the typical uh, medical curriculum at university, you know. Um, so if you like, you can think of yourselves as the intellectual inheritors of amazing individuals like I've just mentioned. And then you, you use that as inspiration to try and be pioneers and be inspirational figures for positive change. Okay, so enough of me sort of rambling on, okay, because I really want to get into the, the important part of, of this workshop, which is the speaker, the speaker section. But again, I just want to thank you all for, for taking the time out of your evening to, to join us for this session. You guys are intelligent, hardworking individuals simply by virtue of the path that you've taken um, into university. And of course, being a medical student or even a, a dentist or anything like that, you're often busy. But again, it really means a lot that you've chosen to spend some of your Sunday evening here with us. May Allah accept it all from us and allow us to achieve the best in this world and the next, in the next one and grant us all success. I mean, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Wajid Akhtar. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khairan for uh, that excellent introduction. To be honest, you probably gave the talk better than I'm going to do in the next 40 minutes. So uh, jazakallah khairan Anas for that. Um, just want to make a quick check. Can you guys see the screen and hear me? Yep, you got a yes from Dr. Shams. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ashrafu al-anbiya, wa salini nabiya Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salim, wa layi the same, and jami'an kathira. Let me ask you the most important question. What is this about? This is a Sunday evening. There are 101 other things that you could be doing with your life. Why are you here? Why are you in this talk? Apart from the fact that maybe your friends or colleagues have harassed you and told you you have to come, this is going to be good or whatever reason that they've given you all these, you know, they've, they've pressurized you and you think, oh, you know, I've got nothing to better to do with my life. Or maybe you're like me. When I was um, doing my PEDS rotation, there was about six, seven of us. And uh, it was at the end of the Friday ward round. And the consultant said, I'm on call this evening. Who's going to join me for a night shift all, all night? And uh, no one raised their hand. So he just looked at me and he goes, you, you look like you don't have a social life. You're joining me. And he was right. So maybe you're like me. But why are you really here? What is this about, this vital session? And what are we trying to get across? Well, for me, the reason why you're here is because of this picture. This is a view that... I doubt any of you have ever had, inshallah, hopefully none of you ever had that, but I've had this view. This is the view from inside a grave. When I was a student, uh, I grew up in, uh, in Riyadh in Saudi. And when we were a student, because there weren't many places to go on uh, school trips. So when you guys go on school trips, you probably went somewhere nice, like I don't know, Cadbury World or something like that. Well, we didn't have anything like that. So we went on a trip to the graveyard and we were, there were some freshly drug graves. So we crowded around to have a look inside, to look over there. There's no body, but it was just a fre it was freshly drug waiting for bodies. And I was just one of the ones looking across as well. Until, and then I felt a hand on my back. And then someone pushed me. <clears throat> and I fell in. My first instinct when I got up was, well, who pushed me? Who the heck pushed me? And when I saw it, it was my teacher who had pushed me in. 
But very quickly, before I had even uttered a word, I realized where I was. I was in a grave. And it's not that deep, it's six foot, but I could tell you right now that it felt like the smallest place in the world. From that day until now, I am scared of heights and closed spaces. And it was absolutely took my, you know, it, it took my voice away. I couldn't even say anything. But I looked up and then the teacher looked down and he told everyone, he said, do you see where Wajid's standing there right now? He goes, he's inside a grave. Just remember, every single one of you has a piece of earth. Somewhere in this world, there's a piece of earth with your name written on it. And every step that you take, every movement you make, every breath, is taking you one step closer to that piece of earth. And if you remember that, now go live your life accordingly. I remember that. I still remember that to this day. We're here. You, I hope you guys are here, not because you want to listen to some stories, although I know I, I, I do like telling stories. But you're here because you want to leave a legacy. You want to leave something behind bigger than yourself. You want to leave something behind that lives beyond yourself. You know, they say about human beings, a human being dies twice. The first time is your physical death that we all know about. And the second time you die is the last time anyone on this earth ever mentions your name again. That's the second time you die. Because that's usually when your Sadaqa Jariya finishes. Think about it. How many times have you mentioned the name of your great-grandparents? Do you even know the name of your great-great-grandparents who were probably alive just over a hundred years ago? And how many people will remember you or your name afterwards? And it's not just about, you know, your, uh, about your name and putting it up in lights. It's about whether your work whether what you lived for extends beyond yourself, whether it's, it's about Sadaqa Jariya. That's another word for legacy. So you're here because I hope that some of you want to build a legacy that lives beyond you, that is beyond you geographically and beyond your time and space. So that when you leave, someone turns around and says, we miss that person. I was at a, a funeral, they were burying an auntie, an elderly auntie, uh, she passed away from cancer. I was standing near the back and there were two people in front of me, they were talking to each other. I didn't know these two people. As she was literally being put in the ground, they were talking to each other, it's, everyone's usually quiet. So when they're talking, they're whispering to each other, but I was right behind them, so I heard. And one said to the other, did you know she was a doctor? And the other guy said, no, I didn't know that. And that's it. I felt like I was going to faint. She went, she studied hard to get through school. She did the best that she could in her school. She probably won the best students in her school. She got into, she did the interviews. She got into medical school. She went through all through medical school. Then she did her postgraduate degree. Then she, then she worked hard. F1, F2, CV, career ladder, building this, that, the other. Everything that she did was you know, a third of her life she spent as a doctor. And when she was being buried, did you know she was a doctor? No, I didn't know that. That's it. It was a sentence at her burial. It made me realize how little the medical, the career side matters to anyone. When they bury you, they don't bury doctor. You know, I'm burying the doctor. I'm burying a CV. They bury what you've done, your legacy. You get paid to be a doctor. No one's going to be like, Man, when they're burying you, they're like, this, war, this person, he, he prescribed the best antibiotics. The war drowns, you should have seen it, subhanAllah, the war drowns. They were like this and like that. And did you know he had a paper? He was second author in three papers and first author in two papers. And he got one even published in this uh, journal. No one will care, not even your children will remember that. So you're here to build your true legacy. That's your job. That's your career. You remember this. What's your legacy? What are you here to build? And I'm here to tell you, this is something that you, if any of you know what I'm about, I, I like to read history. 
but I like to read history in a way that I learn from it. I take away the secrets that they're giving. And that's what I've applied to the various projects that I've done. And alhamdulillah, you, you, you know, you've, seen the, you've seen the evidence in some of the projects, whether it's uh, Charity Week, whether it's part of Bima, whether it's Lifesavers, you've seen the evidence in those projects, wh wh like they, you know, they're surviving, they're growing, alhamdulillah. They're, they're, they're taking place in cities that I've never been to, in countries I've never been to. So what's the secret? I want to share my secret with you guys. And, and I'm confident that the majority of you will completely ignore it because many of you will be like, he's not going to share the real secrets, right? He's not going to share his, his, like, his secret ingredient, what makes, what makes things tick. Why would he do that? Because it will make us get the secret weapon. But because I'm so confident that 99% of you are going to completely ignore this and not follow the plan, I'll share it. And because as Muslim brothers and sisters, I want you to succeed. I don't want to be the pinnacle. I'm nowhere near that. I want you guys, one, one of my colleagues who's a few years junior to me, he said, you know, inshallah, one day I'll achieve what you have. And I said, if you did that, then you have failed and I have failed. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, I, I'm not doing this work so that you can somehow try to achieve what I've achieved. I'm doing this work because I want you to exceed where I've gone. You can't just do what, what I've done. You have to go further. You can't do what the generation before you said. We're just a foundation for you to build the next level up. Stop dreaming small. So I want to give you guys, this is a secret. It's a very simple secret, but it's very hard to follow. And you'll see it right now. How to build a legacy. Any team, any project, anything that you do. Step one, you start with the vision. That's why I go on about it all the time, right? That's why this thing is about the vision. That's why every time in any other project, vision, 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 it's everyone is like, this guy just talks nonstop about the vision. Yeah, of course I talk. This is the most important step. Listen, look at the seerah of our Prophet ﷺ. Don't read the seerah as a storybook. Read it as a manual, as a guide, as a how to change the world. There was 13 years in Mecca and 10 years in Medina. What did Aisha anha say about our Prophet ﷺ? She said words to the effect that had it not been for the 13 years that the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca had ingrained in the people the Tawheed, the love of Jannah and the fear of Jahannam, then when we got to Medina and you had to pray and give zakat and and do whatever else you need to do to struggle in the, in the cause of Allah, no one would have done it. No one would have done it. If Islam started off, if at the beginning of Islam, the Muslims were told, hey guys, right at the start, you need to start off with bang, bang, bang. These are the rules. No one would do it. Why? Because they don't believe in it. There's no vision behind it. The beginning of Islam, number one pillar is not Hajj, is not Salah. Number one pillar is what? Shahada. The vision, Tawheed, right at the beginning, and believing it, and inculcating it, and starting with it, and, and re refreshing it, and renewing it. The vision is first. Without that, you can have all the other pillars, they don't matter. With that, you have hope. The vision is your base. That's what you spend, it's the largest part. That's what you spend the most time on. That's what you need to do. That's what needs to be the strongest. It's the foundation. If that's not strong, everything else will fall apart. After that, you need a team that believe in the vision. It's built on top of it. They need to believe in it. If they don't believe in it, there's no point. They could be as talented. And I'll tell you right now, there, I have many colleagues who are with me. In their little finger, they have more talent in my whole body. These guys, they could do anything. You tell them to code, they'll make you a website. You tell them to speak, they'll give you an amazing Martin Luther King speech. You tell them to, to draw, they're an artist. You tell them to do whatever. Finance, they got it. Everything they know. Where are they? They had everything, but they didn't have the vision. So nobody knows. Nobody's benefiting from them. You need the team that believe in the vision. Their skills come second, their belief in the vision comes first, right? You may be as strong as you want, but one Abu Hurairah 
who believes in the vision, understands the vision, and is a you know relative weakling. He's not a fighter. He's not a you know a warrior. Is worth much more than a hundred brave, strong men who are war warriors and who can you know uh, fight ten people with one arm, but they don't believe in the vision. You need that team. It's small. It's not a big team because if everyone believed in the vision, the Muslim Ummah would be different. The world would be different. And then you have events. Then you do your project. Then you do your your, whatever you, you want to do, it comes at the end. It doesn't come at the beginning. It comes at the end. But when you do it, it has a clear focus. It has a clear vision. It has a dedicated team behind it. And it's leading somewhere. It's the pinnacle of this. And it is done professionally because it's the most visible part. The pinnacle, right? The top of the pyramid is the most visible part. It's the most obvious part. Is uh, is you do it professionally, you do it in a nice way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But... It's the smallest part. What, if you do it like that, you build something stable, you build something strong, you build something that's gonna last, that's gonna be sustainable, that even if the wind blows and if there's an earthquake and there's flooding or economic collapse, it does not matter. This is not going anywhere. This is staying there. How do most Islamic events, organizations, projects, how do they all run? All including most of the ones that you may have been involved in? This is how they run. You start with the event. We got to do uh, Discover Islam Week. Okay, let's do a Discover Islam Week. Uh, let's do this event and that event. Then let me go and find some fools to do the event with me because I got to convince them, hey, what are you doing? Come on, stop taking shisha. Come do this. this stuff. Come on, man. I'm your friend. Just do me a favor. Listen, just do this. Just, blah, blah, blah. And then guilt trip some people and call them, and etc. On the day they don't turn up, they don't do their job. Why are they not answering? I keep sending WhatsApp messages. No one responds. To you guys recognize this, right? I keep sending WhatsApp messages. No one is responding to my WhatsApp messages. Why is it this blah, blah, blah? You're getting angry at the team. They're getting angry. Why do you keep disturbing me? Does he know I'm a medical student? I've got 10 things to do. You have a team doesn't believe in it. And the vision is not even there. Like, you know, like there'll be three events that will happen. All three events will just be weird and random, none, no, not even coherent, not put together. So what happens? The majority of the events are the same people talking to the same people. You literally have an event on Jesus in the Quran with 10 Muslims sitting there. What in the world is the point, man? We've been doing it for 20 years. No one's becoming Muslim on, that, on the back of that. Not a single person would be like, I went to the amazing Islamic society event and they handed out to me the number, they told me the number of times that Mary is in the Quran and I was just fell back. I became a Muslim straight away. Come on guys, just stop this nonsense. But that's what happens, poorly thought out event, unstable team, this structure, if the pyramids were built like this, it would have disappeared. It wouldn't even need a wind to blow away. It would just blow away just like Every single one of you cannot even remember who was your ISOC president five years ago, right? What did they do? Can you name one event from two or three years ago, most of you? What are their achievements, whatever? What? What was the point? No one's benefiting from each other every year. I remember one guy, he told me straight up, he said, my job is just to recreate the wheel every year. Right? It's not my job to do anything more than that. It's like, SubhanAllah, will you be recreating a wheel? We'll be doing this stuff in 200 years time when, when people are teleporting and, and, and conquering distant galaxies. We'll still be running ISOC events for 10 people talking about uh, Jesus and the Quran to people who don't even believe in Jesus or the Quran. So, this is a secret sauce, guys. It's not, it's, I'm not making anything complicated. It's very simple. But you just need the discipline to actually do it. It's very simple, and I'm going to prove to you. I'm going to go into a little bit of depth this in this uh, in a few in the next few minutes. I want to go into a little bit of depth. So how are you going to do it? Because I've I've said this before. Some of you may have even heard this. So how are we going to do it? Firstly, you need to understand what the vision is, and I can tell from a mile away who understands and who doesn't get it. Who just is nodding away? Just like look, as any khatib will tell you. I remember one of my friends, you, like, you, you stand up um, on the member, and you know, the, when you stand on the member, it's three steps, so you're actually a little bit, you know, um, you've got a good bird's eye view of the entire congregation. So you can actually see what's going on in their heads. You can see who's like, oh, man, this guy is not stopping. You can see who's like, question mark over their head, like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. You can see who's rolling their eyes. You can see who's yawning, who's sleeping. You can see everything, right? So you, you get like instant feedback on your khutbah. 
So you can tell those who are understanding what you're saying, because when you say something, it's like, bing, there's a light that goes on their face. It's like, there's a light on their face. They're like, whoa, I just got that. And they'll remember, they'll probably go home and tell them, you know, the khatib said something. I, I've got to share with you. It's really good, actually. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, it resonated with me. But you see it so rarely. I remember one of my friends, he, he used to khutbah at, the, at, at med school um, uh, along with me. And people would accuse us. They would accuse us that we were too negative. Um, so, you know, he said, oh, I'm going to, okay, you know, you talk about Jahannam or you only talk about the bad things. Talk about good things for once. So he took the feedback on board and he got up and he started talking about Jannah. And he was like, you know, Jannah is this, and Jannah is like that, Jannah is like this, Jannah is like that. And then, you know, five minutes into it, he just, he broke. He was like, I don't know why I'm talking about Jannah. You guys are half asleep. You're not even paying attention. You don't care. I should talk about Jahannam because at least then you pay some attention, <laughs> you know? So understanding, you can tell who understands, who takes the time to, to, to think about it. And what I mean by understanding is really it's your brain. You understand it here, right? What should be our vision? I've done this before, but it's a useful exercise. What should we work towards? What should be our energy, our focus, etc.? Allah, there's so much. There's so much that you could do. And I'm just going to list some ideas here. But we could and we need to help Muslim students who are the, the most disadvantaged of any sector in the whole country, help them get into medical school, right? Many of them, their parents maybe don't speak good English or they don't have any idea. They don't have a clue. How am I supposed to get into medical school? We need to do something to help them when they get into medical school. What are we going to do for Muslim students who are in medical school? We need to connect medical students to senior doctors, you know, mentorship. We need to do research into Muslim healthcare students. What are their attitudes? What are, their, what, what, what are the things that they find problematic? What are their attitudes? What are they thinking? What are they wanting to do? We need to work with the pharmacy students and the dental students and the nursing students because there are loads of Muslims in that profession. We need to work on the mental health of medical students. We also need to work on unhealthy eating habits. How many of us have uh, access to just fried chicken day and night? It's PFCs, KFCs, LFCs, uh, you know, all the FCs that are out there, whereas our Muslim, non-Muslim colleagues are actually eating healthier food. What about hijab in theaters? We need to think about that. What about bare below the elbow on placement? Because we get problems with that, where we have a aggressive nurse saying, you need to be bare below the elbow, etc. What about Islamophobia by individuals? If you're on a placement where your teacher does Islamophobia, what about Islamophobia systemically? Because we need to think about Islamophobia in terms of structures. What about revision tips for SATs? Because this is really important. It determines where people are, so we can give revision tips. What about careers advice? People need careers advice. What about international students? Because those guys are coming from Muslim countries. They don't have the support or their families, we need to help and support them because we're their brothers and sisters. Well, Islamic advice on medical issues. Should we be uh, signing cremation forms? What, should, what is acceptable, what isn't? What about beards in theaters? Because people are causing problems and saying that you need to cover up your beards. What about assisting with publications? What about research opportunities? What about FY1 and pre-reg top tips? Because before you start, you want top tips on how you can be the best FY1 or pre-reg or DFT. What about Islamic advice? How will you get your prayers, your jamas? What about Teaching CPR and mosques, that's something that we're pretty good at. But what about inter-uni social events? That will be useful as well. What about medical electives? What about connecting to other Muslim organizations, the Muslim Council of Britain, for example? What about work experience for A-level students? They're finding it harder to get work experience. What about connecting to BEMA projects? There's so many of them. How do we connect? Umrah camp by FEMA, our umbrella body of all the Islamic medical associations. What about connecting to other Islamic Medical Association, other student bodies around the world. We can connect to them and that will be really useful and maybe inspirational. What about getting Eid and Jumar breaks when we're at uni? What about regular webinars? What about revision sessions for finals? Assisting with speakers, Islamic history of medicine, social media advice, representing to the BMA, the GMC, the NHS bodies, national conference fundraising for urgent causes, like if there's someone sick or someone who can't afford to stay at uni anymore, prayer rooms and hospitals, wudu facilities, beard and fist, uh, fit testing. The, the list is just goes on and 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 on. And this is just why I came up in the last, like, in 10 minutes. You could probably fill this again and again and again. So what needs to be done? What should we focus on out of all this? What happens is that we end up focusing, each one of us, because you guys are presumably the, more, the active 1%, 
of the Muslim students. The majority of Muslim students are not active. The actual majority of Muslim medical students are probably not even anywhere close to Islam. There are more Muslim medical students. I say this and I ask anyone to try and disprove me. There are more Muslim medical students in, in, a night, in the disco, in the nightclub of that university on a Friday night than there are in the prayer room at Juma. I guarantee it. Anywhere, I've said this everywhere in every country in the world and no one has yet come back and said, I disagree with you, okay? Um, because we know that on average, most Islamic societies have about 10% of the Muslim students on campus. There are more who are in the disco or in the club every Friday night. Um, so the majority are not interested, they're not involved. You guys are the active 1%. What, do you, what should we focus on? The answer is that every one of you will focus on a different area if you focus on anything at all. Most of you will look at this and just go, I'm out. <laughs> I am out. I, I, mean, I came to study medicine. I didn't come to save the world. Forget this. I don't have time for this. Um, and some of you will be like, no, 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 no. I really, 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 really believe in X or Y. So I'm going to work on X and Y. And you will work on X and Y and you will get deflated. You might even be successful, but for a short period of time, then you have finals and you get married and then you're just like, forget it. It's gone. I've seen this, right? I've seen this for 20 years. Um, and, uh, and that's it. You, you'll get frustrated because you'll be like, why isn't anyone helping me with this getting students into medical school? Why is nobody caring? I keep telling them, but nobody listens. And somebody else is like, why is nobody helping me with getting this Islamic advice? And somebody else is like, why is nobody helping me with this? Everyone's like, why is nobody helping me? Why is nobody helping me? Nobody cares. Then you get frustrated, you get angry, and then you just... That's what happens. And most of these issues, to be honest, don't even get touched because no one to touch them. That's why, brothers and sisters, I'm hopefully making the case that our vision is unite, inspire, serve. I'm trying to intellectually convince you. It needs to start with that word, unity. Only when we unite can we, have, can we actually have a hope in hell of dealing with all of this stuff. Only when we unite can we reinforce each other. Only when we unite does that mean that, you know, I can be in my finals or I can get married or I could be Nozabila sick and somebody else will be continuing the work. Only when we unite do we have that barakah. So that is our first, that is our first thing. Then we need to be inspired because our scholars have been saying unity, unity, unity. It says it in the Quran, unity. Our Prophet Sallallahu has given us the example of unity, but we don't unite. We need to actually inspire each other to do so, to believe in it. And then finally, we need to actually do something. We need to serve. It's no good doing unity, being united or being inspired to be united without actually practically doing anything. If you do that, if you don't do anything practical, then you might as well not have done it at all. We need to practically do something. We need to serve. Who do we serve? We serve ourselves. I'm helping myself. We serve our, our medical community. We serve our Muslim brothers and sisters who are in the medical students or, in, or, or studying medicine, but also dentistry and pharmacy and nursing. We're serving the entire Muslim community in the UK. We're serving the UK. We're serving the global community. We can serve at various levels, but it starts with unity then we must be inspired, and then we serve. We spent a lot of time thinking about that vision. At Bhima, we spent a lot of time thinking about it, and this is why it needs to be this. This is our secret sauce. This is what we are here for. Of course, it's a pleasure of Allah. Everyone tries to work for the pleasure of Allah. If you can sleep for the pleasure of Allah, you know, if you sleep properly, if you eat properly, but what we're trying to do is unite, inspire, serve. And if you do this, then everything else becomes possible. If you do this, all of this becomes possible. Maybe not today, maybe not next year, maybe not even 10 years, but eventually, if you do this, it all becomes possible. And if you refuse to do this, nothing is possible. Nothing will happen. I promise you, it will disappear. And I challenge anyone to show me that it doesn't disappear. It will disappear before your eyes. There have been fantastic projects that Muslim medical students have done. Amazing ones that you will never even have heard of. And it wasn't that, you know, they, they, they weren't good people. They were very nice brothers and sisters. They worked really hard. They sacrificed a lot. 
but they missed out on that unite inspire story. I'm hopefully I've convinced your brains why we need to do that. And you need to convince your brain a hundred different ways why you need to do that. You need to, like I said, if the light bulb isn't going on, if you are not convinced that, okay, the way to securing my Sadaqah Jari and my future is by instilling this within me. I wish someone had told me this when I was at medical school because I could have stopped wasting a lot of time. I regret every second that I spent not doing that. Every second I spent doing that, it's still, the work is still here today and has grown and it has barakah. Every second I spent not doing that, the, I can't even remember what stuff I did. How do you, now that you've done the unit, you, you know, the, I hope you kind of, you, it's going to take time. You can't just be like, yeah, I agree. It's not a tick box. You've got to agree up here to a level that you can convince other people. And this is where the second part comes in. Inspire. You need to inspire people with the vision. How are you going to inspire them with that? How are you going to inspire yourself? A lot of people say, how, do you, how can you keep going? I need someone to inspire me. I need to listen to this inspirational talk. Well, listen, if you need somebody else to inspire you, otherwise you can't do anything, then all you are is somebody else's puppet. You are somebody else's puppet that they can uh, move your emotions left and right and move you around and tell you what to do. Inspire yourself. If you have your own battery pack, re self-rechargeable, if you can inspire yourself, if you have the techniques to inspire yourself, then you can inspire others. Be inspired and you will inspire others. Right? So you need to be able to inspire yourself. If you can do that, you can do what other people can't. Where other people stop, you can keep going. Where other people say, I can't do it, you can. When other people say it's not possible, you say, it is. How do you inspire yourself? There are so many ways that you can inspire yourself. But here are just some of the techniques. And remember what the first was understanding with the brain, right? Now it's about the heart. It's about the heart. How do you convince the heart, right? You, most of you guys aren't married, so you're going to get this analogy. But, you know, as, as usually happens to people who aren't married, you spend a, a lot of time thinking about getting married. And you can spend a lot of time debating, like, should I marry someone who's another medic? Would it be better to marry someone who isn't? Because if I marry someone who isn't, it's good, because then I have a, a, a way into the outside world, because two medics, you know, we're both on calls and shifts. That's not going to be good. But it, if I marry someone who isn't a medic, will they understand how much time I need to give to medicine? And you have these debates. Should I marry someone from my culture or not? Should I marry someone who's younger than, you know, like how much younger is acceptable? Like all these questions that go around in your head. Now, if you have a tick box, and I get this, this, this question asked a lot. You know, someone is like, I, I've written a checklist because, you know, medical students are very good at like, oh yeah, yeah, I've got a checklist. I've got these 10 points. And I'll say, you know, it's nice to have a checklist, but the reality is, um, and you might call me a romantic, but when you meet the right person, the checklist goes out the window. If you meet the right person, it's, if they connect here, then you might have a checklist saying that I'll, I'm only going to marry a medic. I'm only going to marry someone who's like three years younger than me, someone from my culture, um, someone who lives in the same city. But you meet the right person who is none of the above, but they connect here. <laughs> checklist people chuck the checklist it doesn't matter anymore so that's what i'm talking about i'm talking about connecting here right i'm talking about heart to heart not brain to brain how do you inspire other people so there's so many techniques that you can use how do you inspire other people I inspire yourself you can use ayahs from the quran to inspire yourself the quran is 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 Unlike any other book, I, I know I've said this before, but it's, and you, everyone has said it, but if you're looking for your, you know, your inspiration, go look in the Quran, you will find something. It's amazing. There's no other book like it that will constantly give you inspiration and that the same ayah suddenly, suddenly has a different meaning when you look at it from a different time. Um, Imran Khan, um, you know, because someone said, how did you go? He's a... Prime Minister of Pakistan, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he, how did you go from being like the playboy cricketer to being like, quote unquote, Islamic individual leader? And he just goes, and he said it was the Quran. He goes that 
I didn't have, you know, much more than the Quran, but every time I went to it, it's like an onion. It has so many layers. You peel away one layer, there's another layer. You peel away this layer, there's another layer. It has so much depth and layer to it. So that, that is one way. Stories from the Sirah is another way. Show people what is possible. What could happen if we make this vision come true? You can use examples from nature or sports or, what, or books or movies, whatever inspires you. Use an example from other industries. Use Islamic history. Connect with case studies. You know the Prophet some said about you know, um, words to the effect that if you have hardness of the heart, how do you connect with the, uh, how do you remove the hardness? Someone had a hardness of the heart. The Prophet some said, place your hand on the head of the orphan. The words, honestly, it's like I've read the hadith when, since I was like 10 and then I, it, I, it only clicked with me recently. I was like, why did he say place your hands on the head? Why didn't he just say look after? because you need to be within touching distance. You need to look into their eyes. You need for them not to become orphans, just a word to become real to you. One person uh, I was talking to in another project, um, they asked, they said, I, I need to motivate myself. So what I, I, what I do is I look at the case studies of the orphans that we're helping. And I said, no, you need to go to a level beyond that. And they said, then they came back and they said, I've gone to the level beyond that. I, I don't look at their case studies. I actually um, imagine that they're in front of me rather than just, you know, so I actually spent some time imagining that if they were in front of me. I said, you need to go a level beyond that. I said, what's the level beyond that? I said, imagine that they were your children and you were the one who passed away. How would you like them treated? Imagine you were them. So connect with case studies of people who are suffering, people who would benefit from this. Explain how it's beneficial to them. Explain how this vision, how this action is going to be beneficial. It's going to build your CV. It's going to make you a better doctor. It's going to make you a better student. It's going to make you a better parent, a better husband, better wife. Explain how it's beneficial to the community and working within a team. But you should be constantly looking at ways at how you can inspire others and how you can inspire yourself constantly. Like I said, the vision is the biggest part. Spend the majority of your time constantly looking at how you can inspire others and how others can be inspired by you. And living the vision. Now that you, you know, you need to live it. You need to show it in action. So what does living the vision mean? I mean, this is all really good theoretically, but what will stop you? Well, this is in front of us. On the left, you have Shaitan in the 1950s. You know, not so big, not so menacing. But on the right, you have Shaitan 2020, 2019. You know, Shaitan is upgraded. Shaitan will work to stop you doing what you need to do. He's been around for a long time. He's much more intelligent than we are. He's fought against prophets. Do you think that he's going to struggle against us? No way. He's not going to come to you and try to tell you, listen, Ahmed, why don't you drink alcohol? Just taste it. He's too smart. That's not, he's, he's not that, would be a, that would be a rookie move. Do you want to try some Zina? Let's try some Zina. No, he's not, he knows that it's not going to work for you guys. What's he going to try to get you to do? He's going to try to get you to be good when you could have been great. He's going to try to get you to settle. He's going to try to get, get you to make excuses why you can't do all the things that I was just telling you that you should be doing. Those things on the right that they talked about at the beginning. He's going to give you that imposter syndrome. He's going to make you feel like, who are you? Are you a sheikh? Can you do this? You, he's going to make you ask yourself that question. You can't talk about this stuff. You're not a sheikh. What is your Islamic credentials? You're like, I don't have any Islamic credentials. You know what? Well, I should just shut up and not do anything. He's going to get you into hedonism. What's the hedonistic version for medics? Medical students? It's about earning a little bit more money, buying that nice car so that you're scrolling through looking... You know, I'm gonna, I need to buy a house, you know, by the time uh, F2, inshallah, I need to have my own house. It needs to look like this. 
I'm going to imagine what my wedding is going to be like. It's going to, I'm going to have a helicopter that flies me in and, I don't know, horses fly me out or whatever it is. He's, he's going to get you into competitiveness, right? He's going to get you drowned into, like, I need to get 12 research papers with my name on the top because the other guy had 11, so I need to do 12. I need to get 96%. And I'm going to break the bank to get 96% because I can't be 95. He's going to get you with the ego. As healthcare professionals, as medics especially, there is a strong egotistical you know, trait that runs through us, unfortunately. So he's going to get us with that because it'd be nice to get a few more letters under your name, won't it? And anyway, like, I'm not going to be working with these kind of low-life non-medics, these civilians. Like, you know, are they, do they expect me to take orders from them? Like, pff, that's not going to happen. He's going to get you to lack ambition. Got a great idea. Just keep it. Keep it just in Manchester. Don't tell any. Just keep it really local. There's no even point telling Manchester Met. I mean, you're at Manchester Uni. Why, what's the point of going to Manchester Met? Like, they, what are they going to say? They don't even know you. You don't know them. Allah, what's the point? He's going to think, don't, don't be ambitious. Don't think big. He's going to get you to disunite because that's what he gets us to do. You know, the ISOC is not really supportive of us. We need to do a PACSOC. That's what we need. PACSOC. If there's a PACSOC, we need a Psalm sock. And we need a Bangla sock. And an Arab sock. Kurdish sock. Kurds can't have it. If there's a Kurdish sock, there needs to be a Turkish sock. And then we need another sock. We need, we need a sock for everything. Right? It's his modus operandi. Disunite. But you can counter all these things. He's going to come at you with every excuse under, you know, under the sun to get you not to do what we just talked about, to get you to settle, to get you to give up, to get you to think that you cannot do it when everyone else can. He's going to get you to find any excuse. That, you know, I can't. Why? Because I was in the WhatsApp group and I, I cannot stand that brother, the way he talks. So arrogant. Just, I'm not even going to argue. I'm just going to drop out of the group, right? You, you, everyone's done it all the time. So rude, so arrogant that you're in a group and you decide to just left the chat without any explanation. That's the way it works. I'm not going to respond. Why? Why should I respond to the group? Just to make the guy who's working so hard to put all this together and put organized event just to make them feel good? No, they're not even worth that one sentence of my time to say, well done, or thank you. He's going to come up with every way to make you not live that vision. Because living that vision means putting other people before yourself. Living that vision means that if we're setting up something like SBIMA, we need to think about our brothers and sisters in Fosis, for example. Are they going to be a little bit worried? Yeah, they might be a little bit worried. They might be thinking, wait a minute, is this a competition? But we need to go out of our way to show them that actually we're going to make Fosis even stronger, for example. That we're going to be the, en the engine and the drivers. That we need to think, you know what? What about, we keep saying medic, medic, medic. What about the dental students? What about the pharmacy students? Don't we make them feel like second class citizens? And you know what? Everyone around us, everyone is Asian. Where are the Somali uh, brothers and sisters? Why are we not asking? Where are they? They exist. We need to ask. What happened to the Sudani brothers and sisters? What happened to the sisters? Where, where are they? So many questions. Live by example. Think of others before yourself. Put others before yourself. I'm going to do this for the betterment of the wider community and not for the betterment of, even though my own Islamic society takes a hit. I need to take a hit, but I'm going to do this. Be patient, sober, and guard against this unity. I, I know my time is nearly up, I only have a minute, but I'm going to show you a quick example of what I mean. Because I think it's good to show examples. Let's use Salah al as an example. You all know Salah al right? Let's follow the steps. Step one. Do you think Salah al was the first person to try to uh, uh, liberate Jerusalem? Absolutely not. People have been trying for 100 years before him, up to 100 years. But he got minute one. We're not gonna work, it's not going to work unless we're united. Unless we work together. Then 
He inspired his team with the vision, with the people. We're going to have a very clear goal and objective. We're going to liberate Jerusalem. Very clear. Everyone can get around that. Everyone can see. There's no like, what is he, what, what is he, what is he planning to do? What's his thought? Well, I don't even know. What, can, you, can you give me your mission statement, your 10-point mission statement that I'm going to forget like that? Can you show me the PDF? Oh, God, guys, if you can't, if your vision can't come out of the words of your enemies, then it's not worth having. It needs to be memorized by everyone. It needs to be memorized even by those who are against you. They know what your vision is about. Otherwise, how can you live it? That's why it's La Allah Muhammad Rasulullah, not, you know, 50 page uh, uh, sermon. The vision is concise and everyone can follow it. And then he lived it. He took a hit. He took hit after hit. He was abused. You know how much he was abused, right? The Khalifa in Baghdad, because Sahadin was running out of money, and the Khalifa in Baghdad sent him, you know, he asked everyone for money, especially the Khalifa in Baghdad, and he sent him, the Abbasid sent him literally the spare change in his pocket. Like, if that isn't an insult, I don't know what it is. You know, like he just, you might as well slapped him across the face. People were like, his, Sahadi's own men were like, who is this joker? You're stronger than him. Why don't we just pop over to Baghdad and give him, and teach him who the real boss is? Sahadi was like, no, patience. I live for unity. I die for unity. We're going to be patient. When that same Khalifa turned up after Jerusalem was liberated, when he turned up to take part in the victory celebrations that he had no part in, deal, in, in helping with, that he was even actively trying to ignore, Sahadin got off his horse and led his, the horse of the Khalifa like a slave. And the Khalifa was being embarrassed. He was like, you don't need to do this. There are slaves who do this. Sahadin was like, to be your slave is my greatest honor. He was showing his people that he lived by that vision. And we don't even need to think about, you know, you could think about anything. Lord of the Rings, they have a clear vision. They need to destroy this ring. It needs to go. And they inspire each other with a vision through amazing talks and telling, you know, and, and, and sacrifice and working with each other. And then they lived that vision. They worked together, each backing each other up, even though they may be from different, whatever thing you might call them, like a dwarf and an orc or whatever. They're, they're working side by side. It applies to NASA. You understand the vision. This is Kennedy giving the speech at Rice University. And at Rice University, this guy says, you know, at this time, America is falling apart. America is facing against, off against the Soviet Union, who is winning in the space race, put the first satellite in orbit, Sputnik, that was the Soviet Union, first human being in orbit, Gagarin, that was Soviet Union. America, meanwhile, has civil rights problems. America has women's rights problems. America is still struggling with the debt from World War II. America is st struggling with um, so many problems, so many difficult issues. And at this time, this guy comes along and he goes, we're going to the moon. What? We're going to the moon and we're going there before the end of this decade. And he said in this speech, and if you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's on YouTube. He goes, we do this and the other things, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because this is going to make us work harder. Because this is going to bring us together. It's going to bring the best out amongst us to make this happen. He said this speech in 1961, 1962. And before the end of that decade, as he predicted, even though he was not there to see it, they put a man on the moon. You know, this is a picture from Apollo 11 mission control. The average age of these people who are there to put the man on the moon was, 20, was in their mid twenties. That means most of them were teenagers in school when they heard his speech. And they were inspired to change the world within 10 years. When he went to NASA, he was meeting all the different people and he saw a guy standing with a broom cleaning the, 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 the hallway, a janitor. And he asked him, what do you do? You know what the janitor said? Because he was inspired by the vision. The janitor said, well, Mr. President, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. He didn't see himself as a janitor. He didn't see himself as someone just cleaning a corridor. It could be any corridor. I'm helping put a man on the moon. We're all part of this. 
whatever role we play, that's inspirational. And then you live the vision, you actually go and do it, and you go down in history for it. So my brothers and sisters, I'm gonna finish now. My conclusion, I know I've gone over time and I apologize for that. My conclusion is that what is the disease and what is the cure? The disease that is afflicting us, the disease that's afflicting us is that we are not united together on what? Not we united with each other, but united upon Islam to help achieve what we could achieve. We're the same people, the same faith. Islam hasn't changed from when we were kings to now. Same five daily prayers, the same prophet, the same Quran, the same everything. The only thing that has changed from when we were kings, from when we were discovering the cure for diseases, from when we were building beautiful buildings, from when we were safeguarding the world, to now when we are doing nothing, <coughs> is that we are not united. There's a good quote from Albert Einstein which says, strive not to be a success, rather strive to be of value. Strive to be of value. So I finish with this point. Why are you here? I hope you are here because you're going to make a change. One by one, society by society, country by country, inshallah, that you're going to decide that you're going to use your head to understand the vision, your heart to be inspired by it and inspire others, and your hands to work towards it, inshallah, to live by it and to not make excuses or not let shaitan make excuses for you and why you can't. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, and astaghfirullah, and atubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum, Dr. Wajid. Jazakallah khairan for your talk and for sharing so many different gems um, from your experiences as well as backing it up with evidences and stories that we can all understand from um, and also most importantly explaining why it's important um, so that we can build that understanding Allah. Um, I understand that there are a few people with questions. I wonder if it's possible um, to ask maybe one or two um, or if it would be possible to maybe relay them to you another time inshallah. Yeah, no, go for it. I'm more than happy, especially some of the questions where maybe people are wondering that, are we not creating this unity? Maybe we're doing this separate to Islamic society or whatever. And this, it, you know, it's a, it's a valid question to ask. But, you know, Muslims tend to have a, a view that we always, there's, a, there's only a small pie and we can only fight each other for that small pie. But we can make the pie bigger. Let's be honest that the Muslim medical societies, med medical school ISOCs across the country, they're not working together most of the time. All those issues that I mentioned on the slide, they're not being dealt with. And no one society can deal with it. What we need is if we work together, then we can actually help each other, some societies that need more help than others, to improve. What we need is, so it's not taking away from the Islam society. If you want to continue with the ISOCs the way they are, with the same 10 people talking to each other and high-fiving each other, you can continue doing what you're doing. But as, you know, again, Einstein said, it's a form of madness to keep doing what you're doing and expect different results. So if you want to do it in 10 years time, I'll still be back here, inshallah, to give you the same talk to your next generation after you've moved on, to tell you guys that fantastic, we're back, we're, we're still at square one. You need to think differently, you need to think bigger. Just because we're uniting uh, uh, amongst a bigger group, we're not detracting from the individual, individual parts. Unity enhances the individual, not detracts from it. That's what Islam comes to bring. We have unity on a, uh, on a nationwide level, something like the Muslim Council of Britain, for example, takes all the umbrella bodies under it. We have unity uh, on a student level. You've got the FOSIS, Federation of Student Islamic Societies, in around 50 years, mashallah, uh, that you know, they bring all the societies together and if, they have, if you have a unity within that of the medical societies, then it's so much the better. The problem comes when you, know, when you have uh, disagreements. If, say, MCB and FOSIS were fighting, or FOSIS and SBIMA, or SBIMA and, uh, and, uh, and the individual societies, this was where the problem comes. But actually, in reality, if we all put the agenda of everyone before ourselves, then we can, we can do better, we can do bigger, we can, and we can enhance each other's activities, inshallah. 
uh, I also don't want uh, to, you know, I generalize a lot. I made it sound like, okay, being a doctor is like pointless, you know, you know it's, not, it's not worth a uh, sadaqah jariyah, that's not true, of course, but you get paid to be a doctor and it's your career. Um, and if you do it with the right intentions, everyone says this, if you do it with the right intentions, inshallah, you know, you get a, a, a reward for it, I hope, that's up, up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, uh, as everything, but you can be so much more than a doctor who happens to be a Muslim, as was said very eloquently in the introduction. You could be a Muslim doctor, an Islamic doctor. An Islamic doctor thinks much beyond, it's beyond their careers. He thinks about society as a whole. You know, we're, we've got the skills as medics. We've got communication skills. We've got prioritization skills. We've got organizational skills. We've got so many skills, alhamdulillah. We make life and death decisions. We have those skills, use them. Enhance everything else. Enhance the other, enhance the Islamic societies. And the others will copy. You know, we need a gold standard amongst Islamic societies. We need something to show this is how it should be. And then what you'll see is other Islamic societies, even if they're not medical, will be like, this, we, this is something useful we can do, we can copy. We help each other, inshallah. And other countries will copy. Other countries will follow the lead that is set here, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, for expanding on the questions that we did have. Um, I know there are loads and loads more questions that people would have to ask you but unfortunately um we do have to move on to the second aspect of our program for tonight and um, before we uh bid farewell to you i just like to say uh honestly may i reward you for all the time that you spend um developing and feeding back with sbema and inshallah everything that comes from it as well will also weigh on your scales um and it's accepted from you and from us um and I want to say to you, if, if I offended anyone, if I said anything out of turn, that's entirely me. Sometimes I, you know, I think it's a function as you get old, you get a bit more cranky, not on the SBMA team at all. Uh, but please forgive me, that's not the intention. I do want to shake people a little bit. I don't want to lull you into sleep. I want you to feel something, even if it's a little bit angry, even if it's a little bit agitated. I want you to feel something because maybe if we feel something, we might go out and do something. Prove me wrong. Uh, you know, uh, please do. Because for me, you guys are, you know, I haven't built a single mosque. I haven't written a single book. I, I'm praying to God that you guys do something amazing because we, your ummah needs you to do it. And you're, I hope you are part of my Sadaqah Jariya as I hope that the generations after you will be part of yours. Jazakallah khairan everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.